Okay, uh, now a lot of people know me here. I'm not going to talk much about myself. You can go through it, go through all the I'm not sure that you can find some of the stuff like that. I've actually done a bunch of plugins for Gradle, uh, and I'm quite active in the community. I've done a lot of work with all systems over the years. Uh, I've worked with most of them. I've done a lot of stuff in Make over the years. I've written stuff that I never want to write in my life again because it's been so complex. I've worked with Scotland's, uh, Nant, and Maven, probably everything. So, uh, I've got a kind of perverse affinity for working with all of because I always think this is the little thing that everybody ignores, but it's a thing that actually falls with God. But the reason I actually talk about Gradle is because I think it's a very, very great ball system. I think it's a new generation ball system, and if we look at things as it progress, I mean, probably a lot of people know Mike. And especially if you're older. And it still has its place. I mean, it might have been the default full system for a long time in you know, places like Linux and BSD and Solaris. Yeah, the Linux version of it. But don't put it like a possibly the one that sets out. And it has some good features about it. The one thing is, if you knew you were going to build like C++, C, 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 the rules were implicit already in the whole system. And you only have to find very, very simple rules. You have to say what your files were, and you can actually break them out. And that's a great thing to want about in a vault system is that you can actually do some of things like that. You don't want to spend hours actually writing code, really, for writing the vault system. And but things have progressed. I mean, it was the late 90s, early 2000s. I can't remember when Ant came out because guys were building Java, and I realized Mike was like cutting it. So. They created a new ball system called Ant, and because XML was still cool in those days, they used XML to configure it. And so it progressed, and after all, it was kind of old. You have to always download all of these files, put all these appended somewhere in the repository and check them in. And effectively, Maven came along, and Maven gave us two very, very important things. The one was dependency management. So it's easy to specify the dependency, and it would work out all the of the dependencies for you. The other important thing was that it's actually provided us to work what we call convention over configuration. You put all the source files in a specific structure and you have to configure as little as possible. So in that kind of configuration, we actually find pretty much Gradle sort of coming beyond that. But before we got to Gradle, uh, we had another ball system called SCONS. And SCONS was, is a Python based system. And it was actually one of the first ones that really used a programming language to actually define a DSL, which is really great because you've got a lot more flexibility. You can also easily, if you cannot do something in the world, you can actually write some code to do it, which is also always the curse with anything that uses a programming language as a DSL, because you can write all scripts that nobody can understand. So you always want to avoid it, but it's possible to do that. So when Gradle actually came along, it's really Effectively, I call the next generation. It's gone beyond what Ant and Maven and things like that has done. It's really, well, it's not only a new way of building things, but it's also actually a way of experimenting, discovering what we want out of buildings. And the Gradle DSL is still evolving, but uh, over the years, it's actually been, become a very, very efficient and easy to read system. And that's one of the reasons we actually, that's why we're going to look at the basic DSL and how you can actually start pretty quickly. Now, just to get you going, and if you're uh, very interested in Gradle, I can say there's this little uh, Twitter account. It normally tweets one tip a day. Uh, it's under the hashtag Gradle tip. It's the Go uh, account, and you can just subscribe to it. Now, I'll be going to promote it because I'm the person sitting behind it. Uh, but yeah, I'll leave it up to you to make a decision, and you can go and search the, the hashtag if you want to get some tips already. One other thing I just want to talk about before we get to actually Gradle is this tool called SDK Man. Because you're going to think you might be new to Gradle and you think, how am I going to install it? So you might want to download it, it's installed it somewhere. And then you're going to think of how I'm going to manage the versions of it. So this is wonderful tool called SDK Man. It actually originally came from the Groovy community, but it's actually a tool for installing various 
kind of uh, frameworks and tools, etc. And you can very, very easily uh, switch between versions. So let's just have a quick look at this. Let's see if I can get that up there. I want to show you. I'll probably have to use some screen. There we go. So if it's still active, I'll show you if I can install it on the screen. But I can pretty much just say, on, work there. And what I'm going to say is again, this is actually going to show you all of the um, kind of tools that's available there. So you can activate the, oh, this all this one. Oh, and you can actually install and with this. And uh, there's a bunch of other ones in here. So on, and ASCII Doctor. There's quite a number. So what I'll actually want to do just go over here. Okay, so you have a, a big list of them. You can actually check which ones you have installed. So I might want to check which one of my list of my ones is installed. And it will actually give you a list and it will add also everything with the star I've got installed. It will tell me all the versions that's available. <coughs> and it will also tell me the default version is actually active. So I can switch up. I now just run Gradle at the moment. It will tell me that I've got installed version of 2.12. And I can just. So I want to switch, I want to use something else that I want to install this. And so this is what I've got this one install. Uh, I like to say I want to try to do this. Sorry, this is the case. Use Gradle to do this. And now I can actually convert here to version 211 of Gradle in my shop. So it's so easy to switch between different kind of tools. You can even install Maven this way as well, so you don't actually have it separately installed. So if you want to work with tools, a lot that's a very easy way of doing that. So if you want to install it, it's going to pretty much be as easy as just running this little curl command line. There's a version for Bash, which is written in PowerShell, which you can use. Uh, but with Windows 10 getting Bash, you might be able to use it directly. Uh, if you don't trust the script, you can just go download and have a look at it. But you can actually install that way like SDK Man installed it there already. <coughs> and it's a very, very useful tool to go. So, uh, if you're going to read more about it, there, this is actually a good tool for SDK Man. So, uh, we spoke about Gradle, and um, we have decided, well, I have decided that I actually like it. Maybe you'll like it afterwards. So, Let's just start with it. If you actually, and we're going to primarily only talk about JDK building today, I uh, a JVM building. And if you're actually going to build a Java project with no test, just code, that's the only line you need in the build Single line, it just says apply plugin to Java, and if you put your source code, source main Java, and the normal structure of packaging underneath it, it will hold. That's the simple stuff. But of course, uh, you want to be better than this. So let's have a look at it. So yes, a little simple project. And we're going to apply Java. We can tell it what repositories we want. And then we're going to tell it which dependencies we want as well. And we'll come back to those things over there that says like test or file or compile. But if you know Maven, then you will actually sort of test compile the same as test. And you have the same process. They are a good mapping so you understand Maven to get to some of the configurations that's actually in that program. But that's your simplest way of actually breaking it up. And we can actually hold that and run that. And then, well, if you don't trust me, let's run it. Uh, I can switch the screen and get it with help. Actually, look at project, and 
the way that Gradle works, it installs a bunch of tasks. As you install plugins, it will install all the tasks. And if you scroll down this one, you will actually see that but it's got a couple of basic tasks in there. It's got a check, it's got a test task in there. And it also does some other ones, like I say, multiple. And it will actually show all the dependencies as well if you want. But you can have a very, very quick way of actually seeing what tasks are available if you don't know what are available. So you just run it on a command line. And then you can actually build it. Ah, we can clean it and we will build it. And for Java, I forgot when Gradle runs it, it's actually trying to for all of your tasks. It gives you a very quick uh, output as it goes to every task, and then it will actually build it, and then you can actually come pick that up. Okay. And if you have got any questions at any point, don't ask if you just stop me and ask. Okay, now, I've shown you the first thing. The first block on that was called repositories, and you can actually very easily specify which repositories you want to pull dependencies down from. And it supports things like JCenter, uh, which comes from Bird Trade, supports Maven Central, also Maven Local, etc. And the thing about the dependency management in Gradle is it's actually quite powerful, it's very flexible. And if you have to do things like excluding specific dependencies where you have like clash between different um, in the transit of dependency chains, there's different versions and clash, you can actually tell it to do that. That's relatively easy to do. And you can actually write it in English, not some kind of obscure XML. And as usual, you can actually just specify all of the coordinates, maybe the coordinates as your dependency. If you were in the previous talk, you already see the Laurent showing some of that. Let me track that. But it's relatively easy, and uh, if you've got anything else, you have your own corporate maiden repos or either repos to just specify. Yeah, well, I actually mentioned all of those. The other ones you can also just uh, point it to a local directory uh, on the desk and try to pick up the businesses from there, so it's pretty easy to do. Then, as I said, you can actually specify repositories in very, very different kind of ways. The basic standard way is up there. If you just want to have a Maven repo, just give it the URL. But you can actually fill it around by, if you've got some strange uh, repository or layout or something where you get files from, you can actually specify what you want in the layout and it uses the kind of stuff. If you ever used IV, then you will recognize the square bracket notation for specifying the parts of the coordinates or IV coordinates. So sometimes you can do this, and one of the tricks we sometimes do is to pull stuff from GitHub. You might want to pull this up directly from GitHub, and we actually use the, sometimes the IV repo to configure it and fake up an IV repo. Just put the layer where you find the download file on GitHub and actually pull it down as one of your dependencies. Now that's great. So I'm not going to get into Maven Flash, but I always, as I always say, just try some of these things in Maven. As we progress through this, think about how we've done that. And the next thing is really is the DSL, and I said I talked about Scrums before, which used uh, Python underneath as the DSL. So we have the whole new generation of all tools, uh, like we've got Cobalt, which uses Kotlin uh, underneath, but then again, which uses Clojure uh, underneath. And obviously, Gradle is actually based upon Groovy. And this is still the primary language actually pushing the DSL, but obviously Gradle is evolving a bit, so in the sense that it's pushing Kotlin as well, especially for plugin writing. But if you you can actually write a DSL without having to know anything Groovy. It helps if you want to do extensions. And uh, that's actually a good question. So who, who in the room actually knows Groovy? Only one, two, three, go. So you would benefit from having a quick overview of the language. Okay. Right. I'm just going to put a couple of slides in there. Well, the, the syntax is actually very close to Java, except that it's firstly the good thing is there's no semicolons, which always irritates me if I have to get to any language that I have to write to contain semicolons, which I always get them. And um, it supports both dynamic and static typing. So you have the choice to do that. And the old days, Ruby used to be only dynamic, and it was one of the complaints people had about that the sale was slow, etc. It's pretty fast nowadays. And you can do a lot of static typing in it. So it's your choice. You can actually happily balance your code 
into which way you want to get the benefits from both sides. And normally, in the you'll be coming across this little keyboard for death, and it's nothing else than a flat on job option. Uh, if you call methods, it's the same kind of thing. You create a little chart. Notice that I think it's going to be bubbly here by the top. If you want it to be private, it's protected, you have to say. So this is about the method, which leads to a pretty concise uh, syntax. And the thing about it, with Ruby is you can actually drop a lot of the punctuation. So the first thing you can see, traditionally you would have called that, that bar method with putting parentheses around it, etc. But the first thing you can do is drop the parentheses in most of the cases. So it gives you a bit of better, read better readability. The other thing you, you do if you have to do a lot of operations on the same object, you can actually use something like food and with, and then everything inside it will actually defer back to that object. So it just makes for easy readability, and that's one of the things that actually sort of drives the Gradle DSL as well. Because that little with method in there is called a effective increasing delegation. And the, curly, the blocks of code in the curly braces are really what you do calls closures. So if you work with Java 8, you have to believe with that. This is the same kind of thing. But through the add closures long before Java and that. Uh, there's a couple of nifty tricks you can do with closures as well. So let's just have a look at closures. Now the other trick with it is if you actually put the last parameter in a Groovy method, if you actually use that for the closure, you don't have to put it in parentheses. So you can start with having an ugly call like that, putting all of the code inside the curly braces inside the parentheses. But I'm sure you'll agree with me, that's not that easy to read. So the first thing you can do is you can actually simply put that closure block outside. So you can do like full bar, parentheses, one, two, three, and then put the closure block there. So that really reads better. And if you don't want to put parentheses, you just put a comma at the end and you can do the same thing. So, all of this we can effectively reach the readability, which is the things that start driving a good DSL or a ball tool. So it's a lot easier to write a nice, concrete um, piece of ball script. This pretty much looks like English, rather than XML. And the other thing is that obviously you can also drive this. By default, uh, you can very quickly define maps. Maps are simply putting out square uh, brackets, putting a key on the left hand side, column and the value and it's comma separate and it's as easy as that and actually you can even pass it into methods and you don't have to put it with square brackets you can just pass it as, as um, normal parameters and the groovy compiler figures it out and actually when you do something like find a job Java in um, Gradle it's effectively plugging for the Java as a map which is passed in a flight function okay uh, this is the same thing, you can just put it in square brackets. And once again, because we can drop the parentheses and the square brackets, if you like to have something where you want to call a command line tool and you want to pass <coughs> arguments to it, it will simply become a call, something like that. Now you can sort of already understand, so I'm going to call args, I could call clone on it, and there's parameters, so you're oh, probably going to call it. You can sort of figure it out on the fly and infer it because. It's so easy to read. And then the other thing that's quite important is this concept of closure delegation. You can actually tell, in Groovy, you can tell the closure if I cannot resolve the symbol, where to go look for it. So by default, you always look firstly at the closing object for it, but you can tell them to go look somewhere else. And for instance, yes, okay, so we have two classes here. We've got a food class and a bar class, and food's got this uh, property in the book target. And in the bar class, I'm actually going to have a method to do something, give it a closure. And then I'm going to tell it that that closure is delicate, is my foo object, which is my bar class. So then when I instantiate bar and say do something, target is dead. It realizes target is not in the bar class, but the delicate tells it to look at it. the foo class. It actually goes up there and resolves it at there and then updates the correct um, property. So those kind of things are the things that makes it readable. And if you actually see Gradle script underneath what it's actually doing when you do all of nice configuration, it's actually delegating some way to another object. Which effectively means you can write clean script. Okay, and this first one we'll skip this one so we don't have that much time. Uh, and let's just say if you remember post delegation is probably one of the most powerful things. 
and we actually can do a lot of things. So in or if you can create a class with a touch, which is just a normal insect class we talked about, and I can just say that's my command line and run it. And that's actually that command line will get delegated somewhere, probably to the exact task. But you don't have to worry about it if you write the uh, a Gradle script. This is because it can help you understand how certain things work, but you can also appreciate why you can actually do so much powerful things in Gradle. Okay, uh, so most build tools. Uh, are all based pretty much around the concept of tasks uh, or rules. So Gradle is no difference and you can effectively easily define your own tasks if you need to do something special. And the top one is like there's already an exec uh, task type in uh, Gradle. So you can just have a Gradle type uh, task and it's a type type exec. And then you just have to look up the documentation which is reasonably good. What you actually to put it there. So if we do an exec task, we can say command and you give it the command and then the argument. But I mean you can immediately sort of infer from what it was going to do. Whereas you have to do it in something else, which is even if it's YAML or XML or whatever, it gets a lot harder to figure out. And then you can create your own custom task as well. So sometimes you can create a custom task. And this is something if you're a beginner, the brain will catch you up. So you have this normal way, you'll see the top one only has the closure, and this one has this little left shift. Uh, in the top one we talk about configuration, that's actually configuration in the top. If you do left shift, left shift, it actually adds an extra action to your task. So if you create a completely custom task, you might actually do that, because it says this is the, the action I want to execute. Sometimes people get confused and they put the code they want to execute in the configuration block, and then when it still runs, the code tries to execute far too early and you might see some output or something happening and you don't know what's going on. It's probably because you mixed it too well. Okay? And that's pretty much what I actually mentioned. So if you remember that um, sometimes the things don't work or that code doesn't get executed, you probably still in the wrong block. But it's a generally, usually only a problem if you have your own add your own actions. Okay? Uh, there's also a special block called the bolt script block, and that actually allows you to define this external uh, dependencies, which is not used to build uh, your project, but is actually used to load in this dependencies, uh, which is required to start the Gradle. So, uh, well, we have a DFS plugin in Gradle, which allows you, which actually sits on top of the Apache DFS, allows you to do lots of things on the mobile file system. So, uh, BFS needs an additional dependencies for instance if you want to do FTP or SFTP or something like that. It needs to load them up and it needs to be available to Gradle itself, not your project. So you'll put those kind of things in the build scope. In the old days, that was the only way of actually adding plugins, although there's new syntax for adding plugins as well. Uh, and let's have a Gradle to the one, you can just say this plugins block, you say plugins and the names, and it will go off to uh, the plugin portal and find it for you. Then, there's just one other thing, you'll normally accept tasks for a thing called ex um, extensions. Normally when you just look at a script, you will see the difference, but if you read through the documentation of a specific plugin, it will tell you it has an extension. And what it really means is, it has a bunch of things for the specific kind of plugin, that's global configuration. So, for instance, you want to build a JRuby project for Gradle, uh, <laughs> you want to set the JRuby version. So, you will apply the plugin and then you can actually define the version that you want to use. So, and then all of the tasks are going to be related, we can actually use that. So, that makes it easier that, that you actually go to every one of your tasks to actually set the version. Okay, uh, the command line is generally easy to do just run minus h and uh, that will give the help of the uh, switches you can do. If you run Gradle tasks, it will give you a list of tasks. And if you run like Gradle tasks minus minus all, it gives you all of the tasks and all of the dependent tasks. So if you have one task A that depends on B that depends on C, it will actually show you the instruction. And the other good switch to run is minus minus info if you want more output of what's going on. And sometimes it will completely fail with what's going on. You can actually run minus minus D or minus S, which gives you a stack. Okay. Uh, now. <coughs> When you build projects, 
you always have to sort of worry about which version of the tool am I using because somebody else is going to pull your project from GitHub or something. They should really ideally build it with the same version of Gradle that you actually normally build the project. So Gradle is actually people called the Gradle Wrapper and this has inspired other kind of tools now as well, so like a Gradle Wrapper. You even have a Maven Wrapper now as well. And what you actually do is you create an old wrapper and normally gives you like a jar and a properties file which you commit to your source screen. And it puts two scripts in the root of your project. And then when you run that, the first time you check out a project, it actually bootstraps itself. It goes off the downloads the correct version of Gradle for that project, stores it in the cache, and then builds the whole project with that. So now you can get to the point of having much more defined rules and repeatable goals. So if somebody can't just say, oh, uh, I work with Gradle and doesn't work, or maybe you've used the wrong version. So you can actually get to your project and do exactly this thing, thing like that. It just makes the start of the project a lot easier. If somebody wants to bootstrap it, they don't have to remember which tool to install, where to download it from. You simply just check the wrapper in. Okay, and then instead of running Gradle from online, you just run Gradle W. And there's a little thing called GDUP. Uh, which I use and then it uses this little alias called GW and it just searches up your tree and if it finds a Gradle W in the tree it uses that if it gets to the top of the root of the this and it can't find anything it looks for Gradle on the path and it runs that one so it makes your life a lot easier uh, and this is pretty much standard for all the tools if you run a task, just specify the list of tasks on the command line which you want to run, and it will run them and it will run any dependent tasks. Well, as easy as that. And there's always, most uh, projects have a default task called build. Uh, if you define a very, very specific kind of project which doesn't do the normal kind of lifecycle stuff, you have to specify the task yourself or apply the lifecycle project. But if you do all the standard kind of plugins uh, for programming JVM, they will always have this in. So you, in reality, you just go build and it will build everything. That's pretty much like if you're familiar with Maven, the same kind of thing, you just build stuff. Uh, there's always a defined task which is supposed to build everything and run through all of the steps. So build will do all the compilation, it will run the tests, and it will run a second task to check which does additional things you want to put in it. For instance, it will. Um, run your license checking or it will run your code storage or something like that which you don't normally want to run because it will be too expensive so it's a more expensive side of um, running uh, checking and validation. Okay, um, if you want to know the dependencies in the project, uh, once you define them, you want to see all the grants and dependencies, just run Gradle right with the task and dependency. And actually gives you a whole list, it will give you the top level ones per configuration and all the tasks you want. So, if you want to call the style of project, we're actually going to tell you this is all of my uh, dependencies that I'm actually using. Yeah, um, the great thing about Gradle is actually support a variety of languages uh, on JVM, and people writing new JVM languages is relatively easy to write plug into add and actually support them. Now, Gradle also supports other native languages, so it's got native support of C, C, plus. As well, which actually sets it apart from a lot of other cool tools, and that is continuously evolving. Uh, and we actually use all of it, so we do a lot of JVM stuff and a lot of native stuff, so it's great for us to actually do that. It also happens that we are the people that keep on poking the holes and going on finding ways not actually doing what we need, so uh, it's been pretty vocal about it. But anyway, so there's a lot of uh, JVM languages that are supported. Uh, for instance, you can build Ruby, and if you want to build a Ruby project, you just say, apply. Uh, quite quite Ruby. And then the difference is here because a lot of JVM languages always have an additional runtime. So in Ruby it is the case as well. So you're going to say compile and that's the version that you want in the dependency. And this is pretty standard tool do for Ruby project. And then uh, there's been a lot of talk about Spockers conference. So uh, normally you would test a lot of Ruby code with um, Spock or you can use anything else. I mean we test all of the JVM code. Well, regardless of the language. But for instance, you can actually just say test compile. And now we do something special here because when uh, 
Spock is called, it sort of has a specific version of Groovy in the Stratus of Dependencies. We don't want to pull that version in. We want to use the version that we specify. So I can actually tell it to exclude anything that Spock says is a Groovy or module. So I don't want that. So that's, a, that's an easy way of actually managing uh, from text abilities. Uh, there are even more uh, complex ways of doing things, but it's, I mean, it's keeps it simple. And it's a pretty standard to do. So that's a big Ruby project. We can also call them Scala. Um, and I guess right now when people use SPG. Um, anyone? No? Good. Stay away. Um, you will find actually generally all the Scala projects and play projects with Ruby is a lot, yeah, with Gradle is a lot easier. Uh, there might be one or two things in the SPT that you like, but I mean, now that Gradle is a continuous mode, which means you can fire up with minus T in the one light and leave it, and as you type and do stuff, and it notices that things are changing in uh, the source tree, it automatically reruns your tasks that you told it to. So it gives you all of that. That's one of the things probably that the SPT had for a long time. But, uh, if you actually try to read an SPT script, it's already it's very strange. That's why I say it's easy, and all you have to do is specify the version of the Scala library. Uh, well, we can both talk to them as well. That's just one example. Once again, it's the same kind of thing. But whereas Gradle has native support in for uh, Scala out of the box, it doesn't have to plug them. So you have to apply the plugin from somewhere else. So I say, I want that version of the plugin, and you give it to me. Every plugin has an ID which you can get from the Gradle plugins portal. And uh, give the version and then it will just automatically download it through. And you uh, just specify the version of the plugin. And that's all you need to do for the project. And once again, like we showed you earlier, like you would put your code in source in Java, you just put it in source of the project and then source test project. And as simple as that. And obviously you can add a lot more things, but as an actual project goes, this actually shows you how easy it is to start. Um, but everything goes well, so I've spoken a bit of a JRuby. Uh, I've been involved in developing the JRuby Gradle projects um, over time. So I got probably sort of got here because I wanted to do something as a doctor. And we did an specific support for it in Gradle. We had to call it Maven. And the Maven involved wasn't simply flexible enough for what to do. So I got involved with someone at the stage who was using JRuby to pull a lot of uh, microservices stuff and we actually started with writing uh, a bunch of plugins for uh, Gradle to do JRuby stuff. So now you can do a lot of stuff with it. You can build a full JRuby project with all of the gems and everything in your jars, etc. and it supports all of that. But it just shows you actually a simple example. In this case, uh, we just want to run some JRuby. And once again, it's pretty simple. We just buy the plugin. And then we create a task and we say it from the script first. I mean, there are several plugins, for instance, to do Jypen as well now that somebody's done. So the great thing is that it's relatively simple. You can actually sort of discover from the script uh, very easily uh, what it's supposed to do. And you can easily ask questions because you might say, what's that JRuby exec uh, thing over there? And, and then you sort of set if next thing looks like a dependency or why is it called JRuby exec? You can ask somebody. Well, the answer to that is going to be, it's a configuration, and uh, if you're used to the standard kind of configurations in the uh, Maven, you have all those kind of configurations in uh, Radle as well, but you can easily define extra configurations, and plugins normally put a lot, or a number of additional configurations if necessary. The great thing about these configurations is to keep the dependency sets apart. So, like you would have a, a, a compiled dependency set and a test compiled dependency set, that one necessarily inherits the other one. You can define the extra ones, like if I define JRuby exec, it just says I need those ones for specifically the execution. So, only when I run JRuby exec tasks am I going to use dependencies that's used in that configuration. So, it's, it's very easy to find simple things. And as I said, this supports a whole bunch of other languages. So if you do, if you pretty much polyglot and uh, JVM, there is probably something to do that. And the nice thing is it's actually easy to fix. Okay, so I don't know. I don't know how many people in this room actually use this code. <laughs> I can just do my other graph. It's what I want. Okay, uh, 
Now, <laughs> let's say you actually try to migrate. It has inherent or support for certain build rules, and then other ones can be added by a plugin. So there's native support for that. You can actually pull in a whole and script into your Gradle script and have all of the end tasks reflected inside Gradle. Uh, some other ones would do set pointers. Other ones are not that that uh, they will just inject the DB wrappers and then you can point it to Gudu make one. You can pretty much run a whole make file and use the outputs and just specify where the outputs and use it somewhere else in your project. So it's easy ways of sort of migrating over uh, from one type of tool to another. Or if you have very complex builds, which we normally end up with, uh, sometimes you have to pull the um, um, source of somewhere else and build it. So having, and they are obviously with a different kind of build tool. So instead of just depending on the build tool, you need to it by then. <coughs> having this kind of support is very, very useful because you can just wrap rail across everything else and then just point it to which uh, build tool is run. And yeah, and this, especially to do JavaScript, is run on gold, and this supports for uh, Bow and NPM. Everything now actually in Gradle. At various levels of maturity, uh, but you can have a look. So it might be easy to actually wrap up some other things and then just use Gradle to actually all the whole Because it will take care then of doing things like publishing and running up top instances, etc. It's a lot easier to find those in Gradle than most other books. And really, if you don't have support, you just use a Java exec task or a plain exec task. Um, you can also actually build documentation. So there's nice plugins available for converting like Markdown and ASCII Doctor into documentation. And uh, obviously, I mean, Java Doc, Scala Doc, Ruby Doc, all the tasks for automatic is uh, made available for you if you put the right plugin in there. So it will do all of that. Uh, and there are there are like tools added, like like the Docs Engine tool has been added to uh, support the documentation of C and C plus plus. But the nice thing is it actually allows you to bring all of your documentation and your uh, code closer together. Which is actually a good example. I know it's going to raise back. Who actually uses ASCII doc? Only one person. Okay. Uh, I guess markdown. Uh, uh, okay. So, one of the great things actually combining ASCII doctor and Gradle with your code is that you can actually create uh, what we call testable documentation. So you can pull out snippets of the code that you've got, uh, get them into ASCII doctor, and the ASCII doctor gets pulled. But the code is obviously tested, so we know all of the snippets we've got in the documentation are up to date and work. So bringing that closer together actually makes for a better deliverable as well. And don't, you don't have this problem, oh, the documentation says over there, the code says over there. We change the code, we forget about the documentation. Bringing things together uh, makes it easier. And obviously, great it helps with things. So. Uh, and as an example, I just can uh, bring in an uh, ASCII doctor. And that's pretty much the only thing you have to specify. And then you have to specify uh, how to build it and where to find the documentation. But you can run, you can sort of understand what's going on there because it says there's sources somewhere there and I have to use that file and then it says backend. So you, obviously you know ASCII document, you know where the backend is, but you can sort of understand it says HTML5, so maybe this thing is trying to create some kind of HTML5 from that source. This is why I said it's actually great about it, which can easily read. And I keep on repeating the point, it's readability. And this is one of the things why I like the uh, The readability, extensibility, flexibility. Okay, uh, publishing. So if you do the normal things like publish to Nexus, publish to Artifactors, or effectively make kind of publishing, IV publishing, that is supported out of the box. Uh, you just have to say apply plugin with the appropriate name. You can also, via external plugin, do a lot of other stuff. So you can push stuff over FTP, SSH, easy. Okay. I have a big amount of plugins to use and they are all relatively easy to configure. Um, so, as I said, you can push stuff there. Uh, there's a plugin to do things to push to S3, for instance, so you can pull the artifacts and just push it. It's all part of the <coughs> cycle and you can just find extra tasks and here you go. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to talk about Android, but Gradle is an official uh, build tool for the Android project. 
And if you're really into that, then you have no choice but you use Gradle and Compatible. Uh, good. There's only two, there's pretty much only two kinds of goal tools. Uh, the kind of goal tools people don't use are the ones that complain about. Okay, so, uh, right, so we can do a couple of other things. And now, let's have a look at the whole project. So, I'm actually going to run a little project down and have a look at it. And this project, we're actually going to write code in Java, Ruby, and Kotlin. We're going to pull it all together and we're going to package it up in the zip so we can give it away for uploading. So, and the zip is going to contain some scripts as well so we can actually run it on the Windows and then it's it up to make it easy so you don't have to do some kind of job, uh, job by job and more like that. Okay, let's have a look. Let's see if I can get that fired up and hopefully find my uh, terminal. Right, I guess everybody can see that. Look at that. You find it back, can you see that? Guys, that I get it. Okay, so I just want to clean the project first. And then we will be okay. Right, so let's just have a quick look at the source tree. So you will actually see down here, I've got uh, a Groovy file. Java file, I've got the file here, I've got some spot tests down here. Now, languages like Ruby and Kotlin actually supports joint compilation. So it means that you can actually drop Java files into the same folder where the Groovy or the Kotlin files are. This is actually what I'm doing here. This actually helps me a little bit in this case. But we actually get involved with the whole project and file together. Um, so, let's just run it first and you can see how what it does it rules. So you can actually see it's running properly at the moment and uh, now it's compiling Ruby. It says compile Java up to date, but <coughs> it didn't find any files in the Java folder because I put the Java code in my Ruby folder. But it's actually built there. And you can actually see it went through all of the uh, steps. It's got no resources to include, so that would be set to be up to date. And then uh, it's actually built in. And you'll see these two things up there called this zip and this dot. Um, now, let's look at the bulk file first before you get anything else. Okay, so I'm going to talk with that normal kind of thing. Ignore it, it's got a special repository out there because I've actually built this uh, to run completely offline if I want to. So it picks up everything from the local repository. Great. And uh, so, but now you actually get it. So we apply Java plugin, Ruby plugin, we apply the Kotlin plugin, and we've applied this other plugin that's kind of standard to a Gradle called Application. And that's going to actually supply those two tasks that you saw with this zip and this task. And now we can actually have a look. There's my compilation. I said I need that version of Ruby, that version of Kotlin, and I was going to use this version of Kotlin. Okay. Um, and then there is this main class name, which is actually that. This is my entry point for executing the call, actually, the whole job project will be familiar with that. And the only other thing that I see is this little thing that says compiled really depends on compiled Kotlin. I explicitly create a dependency between two things because I actually want my Kotlin code compiled before the rest of my code. Because I've got a. You can't actually look the two things up across two uh, sections of uh, folders. So I forced it all those ones first so they end up in classes so that they can be looked up from the rest. And um, that's the only kind of thing in the whole project. And um, so we've got all of this stuff. We can actually never go and see now. See, it will have created a, a build directory. And inside there, it will have uh, distributions. And um, there's a zip file on the top file that's created. And if we just look inside that. Build distribution. There. Yeah, it looks nice. And that's not going to work. Yeah. Right. So you can see actually my Java has been built, my little project. 
It actually included all my dependent jobs, like my as a standalone project, and it's created two files for me. So I can actually run that. Um, let's see. Can actually, we can quickly test because when you do, I think this is the one, I always forget. Let's see if it works. Right, yeah, actually, so instead of actually unpacking the zip and running it manually, I could actually run it from the uh, Gradle. You can actually see it, it ran there, it says, there's my Java main code, and it ran some Ruby code, and some project code, it says why. So, um, if we just look at a script again, if we had in there, and then it's as simple as, it's not very, that's the whole thing, and it's even got some extras in which you don't know what you need. So I just put it for the presentation. So it can actually show you how simple it was to create that complex kind of setup and um, pretty much hold it. Now, my challenge to you is to go back to the and build it with my. Okay, it was so. Uh, that's the layout again, so let's go through that. And um, pretty much that's what I kind of think I said. Uh, so I hope this has actually been a, um, a useful introduction to you. Because should really be comparing my to Gradle, but unfortunately that happens a lot. You should actually see because maybe cover a specific area. You might be very happy to use it, and it might work for your environment. Uh, if you need a lot more flexibility and quite a lot of stuff, and Gradle is a much better option for you to go. You have to make your own choice on that. But I would say there's a lot of things in Gradle, and we actually, as a community, are learning from it in the sense that we want to learn from it in the sense that we want to know is what are we actually want to put in another generation of all tools comes beyond it. Because there's going to be a common time when Gradle is a little bit cool item, so we have to learn as we go on. Okay, go to plugins, Gradle, or search on it. If you want to plug it, just type in some keywords. There's a good chance you might find one. Okay, uh, this presentation was actually done in SP Doctor, style of Real.js, so if you use Real.js, you might have recognized it. But everything you actually see on all the code stuff is there was tested and all things. So this gets built with Gradle, it runs all the tests, it builds the slides. Okay, and you're going to see how it's done. Uh, well, the slides will go up, will be on the slide share, and uh, you can all get it off. Uh, if you can't remember what the link is, but we'll be on the slide, but you can get it from uh, that specific one. And you can go see what's been done. So it's, it might be an easier way to look at it. Uh, if you actually get more advanced, uh, you actually want to write plugins, and I can tell you writing plugins in Gradle is far easier than later. Uh, I've written two books on the subject, actually. I've written one, other ones in progress, you can get them on the uh, And it just gives you pretty recipes for actually writing plugins. And uh, that is pretty much it. Uh, that's my details you want to get hold of me. And if you need to talk to a consultant, that's my own plug, there's no way to find me. So, thank you very much. Um, we've got probably a minute left. Uh, two minutes one. Yeah, I've got some other questions. Yes. Can I use it to, to combine different codes in different languages? You mean use different languages in your project? Yes, I mean when you go to this tab, there is everybody. I mean, yep. there is code written in so many languages, so now that's what I'm doing, is testing the code to see what it's doing, but I don't want to write all the program, I want to compute it, to use different codes to make different things, you know, because uh, for me it's an invention of time, it's just from starting from the beginning. And I see that this can be useful just to combine these different codes between different languages. Yes, you will have two kind of things that happen is, you might run into problems where you have dependencies between different sections of different kind of code where you can't do joint compilation and what you have to work at is either put in dependencies to do those tasks or split them up into what's called um, as a multi-project build. So you have one core Gradle script that compiles and five core sub Gradle script and then you can build them separately uh, and just call those dependencies but it's totally possible. Anything else? Right, I hope you can go and gradle